And so when I say Chinese, I want you to scream out the, na the nation that's associated with this. For example, if I say Chinese, you're going to say what? China. All right, let's say it with authority. When I say Chinese, you say what? China. All right, that's just a, a test right there. So here we go. Chinese. China. Russian. Russia. Italian. Italy. German. German. Swedish. Swedish. Korean. Korean. Egyptian. Egypt. Nigerian. I hope you were able to successfully identify the issue. We all know February is Black History Month here in Babylon, so as a Gentile, I'm here to profess, Black people, you are Israelites, you are the chosen ones, you are a prestigious people. Your history is in the Bible. In order to better understand why you are Israelites, I'm going to bring forward two witnesses from Deuteronomy 28. And if you're not familiar with it, Deuteronomy 28 outlines the curses of the Israelites for not hearkening to the voice of the Lord. Now I'll bring forth my first witness from Deuteronomy 28 and 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So, because you didn't keep your end of the covenant, follow the law, statutes, and commandments, you've been cursed. Let's take a look at one of those curses and see if it applies. Deuteronomy 28, 66 reads, And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have no assurance of thy life. Now, I don't know about you, I live in America, black people have no assurance of their life, and it's because you're Israelites. Africa has the seed of Israel all throughout the continent. All throughout the continent. This was a surprise for me, friends, when I saw these clusters in Africa, when I start to hear the report. Friends, because of you, we distribute 1,000 books. And our people rejoicing, our people returning to the roots. We are starting to hear reports of revelation in Africa of the Jewishness among the Lembas from Kenya, from the Ebus, from Madagascar. We're getting all of those reports and God spoke to me before I even opened the scriptures. And he says to me, you know what, this is happening? This is happening because the bride have an article of clothing in Africa and unless Africa is ready, the bride cannot be ready. Eventually, DNA testing advanced to the point where the Lembus claims could be put to the scientific test. University of London scholar Dr. Tudor Parfit swabbed a cross-section of Lemba tribe members, and the results were astounding. The Y chromosome, passed on by many males in the population, proved to contain the Cohen modal haplotype. Among Jews, the CMH marker is most prevalent among Kohanim, or hereditary priests. 
In addition, this marker is one that only emanates from the Middle East. It is not found in any identifiable African roots. Even more astounding are the following stats. The CMH marker shows up in 50% of the Lemba tested. The same marker shows up only 3 to 5% of the time in the general Jewish population. I emailed, as you see on the screen, I emailed Jetmatch yesterday at 3.17 p.m. Of course, because many of us email, you know, that's why I say we we not the camps, man. We, we, I don't know who they think they be messing with. You know, you know, you throw a claim out there, you say something, we go to the source. Okay? That's right. We're not going to play around with these folks. All right. So let's send an email. All right. And I ain't hiding where I sent it. I put this right there on the screen. Okay. It say, greetings. I uploaded my raw DNA report to JetMatch, and I used the MDLP Word 22 and received these results below. I was told by someone that these results aren't accurate. Can you confirm that these results are correct? Thank you in advance. Yesterday at 4, 31 p.m. Now I emailed them at 3 17 p.m. So a little more over, you know, an hour and a half. They responded back. <laughs> Check that say, hello, Will. <laughs> I cannot comment on why others would say your results are inaccurate. <laughs> the results look correct. And there are no problems with either of your DNA kits. Let me say that again. The results that you are a limba all the way down to the 20th nation population that we ran against you, the results look correct. And there are no problems with either of your kits. It's over! 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 It's over. Peace and blessings. I want to say Shalom, Lak, Mash, Pakha. Want to say peace and blessings to everyone that's tuning in tonight. Got a lot to cover. That's just a little summary from uh, Friday, uh, Shabbat, uh, which many of you guys, uh, well, just in case some of you guys did not catch it, um, my cousin, Pastor William Brown, Pastor of Boom uh, Church down in Atlanta, as well as uh, location in Florida, and um, I believe he has a location in Ohio as well. Uh, Jed Match uh, confirmed what we already knew and made it clear that our DNA, there's nothing wrong with it. All right. So I just want to just kind of give you a summary of those that may have missed what transpired this weekend, especially for those that are uh, has been coming against us in regards to who we are. And so no matter what the most high, I mean, what, no matter what others may try to do to try to come against us, everything that they created to try to uh, use as a weapon against us, the most high has literally turned it around for the good of his people. All right. So let's go to get started tonight. Before we get started, I want to um Give shout outs to everyone that's tuning in because we have a lot that we want to cover tonight. Going to kind of kill two birds with one stone per se. So before we get started, let me go ahead and go through the comments here. And let me acknowledge who who's online, who's um, watching right now. Let me just go through here before we get started. I want to say peace and blessings to Mr. The Original uh, School. I want to say peace and blessings to you and really appreciate you for tuning in tonight. Also want to say peace and blessings to um, Elect of the Earth. Uh, who else do we have here? Um, Sister Shalon, want to say Shalom Lak Mash Pakra. So I want to say Shalom to you. Tawada Akwath for all your support. Really appreciate you. Um, a brother, uh, Rose Tally, appreciate you as well. Uh, Sister Carol, 
Appreciate you as well. So want to say peace and blessings to you. Brother Tyrone, want to say peace and blessings to you. Child of the book, peace and blessings to you as well. Uh, Yuda Israel, want to say peace and blessings. Sister Yvette, peace and blessings. Prisoner of hope, want to acknowledge you as well. Want to say shalom to up next. Uh, who else do we have here? Uh, Miss Elaine, I uh, want to say sh shalom to you. Uh, who else do we have here? Strong Island, keep it buck, all right? Strong Island, uh, right across the water from you. Um, Newark, New Jersey is where I'm from, but peace and blessings to you. Uh, Angela um, Caraway, want to say peace and blessings to you as well. Want to say shalom. Uh, Lola, want to say peace and blessings to you. Dennis Clark, as well as um, my friend here, um, truth be told, want to say peace and blessings to you. 34 Jazzy. Um, the Orthodox Moor, I want to say peace and blessings to you. Uh, I want to say um, peace and blessings to who else do we have here? Sisters, Knit and Moore, want to say peace and blessings to you. All right. Inspired Identity, I want to say peace and blessings. Uhama, I want to say peace and blessings as well. All right. Your voice, I want to say Salama to you as well. Anitri Ya, uh, Patricia Thomas, uh, who else do we have here? Lit Excellence, Anayer, Tiff C, Devar Cotton uh, C21, Jay High Style, want to say peace and blessings to you as well. Uh, you know, I, I just love that name, Jay High Style. Again, uh, takes me back uh, to my breakdancing days. Peace and blessings to Susan, Sister Susan, Antonio Wells, peace and blessings to you as well. Peace, I appreciate all that you're doing, my brother. Uh, who else do we have here? Tia Yah, I want to say peace and blessings to you. Uh, Brother Abbott, I want to say peace and blessings to you. Elkam, uh, who else do we have here? T Main, uh, Angie Yah, Yala, excuse me, Angel. And let me make sure I read it quite correct. That's right, Angie Yahaya. I hope I pronounced it correctly. From forgive me if I didn't. And so I think I got everyone, and I think it's still others popping in. Um, Adonai, I want to say peace and blessings to you as well. Uh, who else do we have here? All right. Kenneth Wilkerson, uh, Wilkerson, uh, Wilkerson excuse me. I want to say peace and blessings to you. All right. Um, let's see here. In search of Yah, uh, I want to say shalom to you, as well as um, Donna Johnson. I want to say um, shalom to you or shalom to you as well. And I pray that you had a great Shabbat. Hallelujah. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here, guys. We got a lot to cover, and I know this is going to be or can be a sensitive subject to some um, as well to others. And so let me go ahead and highlight this here. Let me enlarge my screen. And so the reason why I'm doing this lesson is because um, I saw a post, and this has been something that's been happening a lot. See a lot of double standards among our brothers and sisters. I see a lot of women, um, really um, brothers going in on women that have uh, married someone that are, that is not part of the community. And so I just really want to give clarity on that. I'm not here trying to pass judgment on anyone. But at the same time, we have to uh, lay the facts, um, go through the scriptures as we are, are supposed to do. Now, I want to make this clear. Um, as for me and my house, uh, you know, we, we stick to what the scripture says. So I want to give you proper clarity on what the scripture says and what it teach about Israel being involved, getting involved into mixed marriages. Right. Those there are challenges that come with the territory. But we're go we are going to let the scripture speak for itself. And I'm not going to. Uh, put a lot of my own opinions and all of that to the will let the scripture speak for itself. All right. And also while we at it, I'm going to address uh, the Moors. I'm not going to go too deep into uh, the Moors, but I'm just going to touch on some of the doctrine and I'm going to show you why uh, I am using the Moors in terms of the doctrine. As an example, this is not an insult to any of our people. This is strictly for uh, doctrine. 
strictly going to uh, really dealing with doctrine tonight. All right. Because sometimes we get too uh, we, we, we tend to go over that line and start getting personal with people in terms of how we are uh, using the scriptures. So this right here, I am not here to try to deal with any uh, uh, personal things. I'm laying it out. I'm laying out everything according to scripture. All right. So let's go ahead and um, um, move forward with this. Let's move forward with this. All right. And um, again, let's let's um, not if, if there's anyone that jumps into the chat, do not allow yourself to be distracted by them. And moderators, you already know what to do. If it's, if there's anyone that jumps in the chat being disrespectful, feel free to block them and they'll still be able to watch the video, but they will not be able to interact. So let's move forward here. Mixed marriage, active hostility. I want to start off with this article here, and this will help put things in this proper perspective. New York Times, January 20th, 2012. A definite shortage of marriageable men or black men, to be exact. It says a definite shortage of marriageable black men. More than one and 10 black men in their 20s or early 30s are currently incarcerated. And some experts estimate that as many as one in four black men will spend some time behind bars. Only half of black boys graduate high school. Unemployment, incarceration and lack of education shape people and undermine the qualities. Excuse me, undermine the qualities that women seek in a spouse. Some ex-convicts or high school dropouts find good jobs, but most do not. Black men without college education like less educated men of all races confront an employment landscape in which the well-paying labor intensive jobs on which earlier generations of men relied have either been eliminated by technology or moved overseas. The harsh truth is that as black women have moved ahead, black men have have fallen behind. And, uh, you know, we could really talk about this, but I'm not going to really go too deep of this uh, for the sake of time and what we're dealing with tonight, uh, because I could show you proof of the calculated attack to completely break up the black family by um, really suppressing the men and uh, moving and, and, and further empowering the women. That's a whole nother discussion in, in itself. But I just want to uh, focus on a couple of key points here. So the harsh truth is that as black women move moved ahead, black men have fallen behind each year. Nearly twice as many black women as men graduate college. Black women have surpassed their male counterparts, even in lucrative and typically male dominated fields like computer science. Twice as many black women as uh I, I'm going to skip down here in the bullets here. Compounding the number, the numbers problem is that black men marry interracially more than twice as frequently as do black women. Let me say that again. Right. Because if we're saying that there's a shortage. Right. Of available men. According to this article and statistics. Of a shortage of available black men versus black women stating that the black women outnumber the men. So why is it that these numbers are higher for men to get involved in interracial marriages and relationships? Let me read some more of this. Com- um, compounding the numbers problem is that black men marry interracially more than twice as frequently as do black women. More than one in five black men now marry a non-black spouse compared to fewer than one in 10 black women who do so. You see that? Pay attention, guys. Make a note of this. Make a note of this. So it's supposed to be, right, 
for every man, 10 black women. Right. But yet we see twice as many. Black men. Marrying white women. In comparison to black women. So I want you to pay attention and make a note of that. You know, think about that. Shouldn't it be much lower? You would think it'd be reversed far as the numbers. But when you look at the entertainment, when you look at sports, most athletes, um, Negro athletes, Negro men, who do you see on their arm? When you look at music videos and you see uh, many of the uh, hip hop artists, who do they have on their arms, their arms? When you look at um, a lot of successful men, when you look at doctors, many that are lawyers, who do they have on their arm? So many women, so many communities have invested in these guys. But then who do they normally end up with? We have to be real with this. We have to address this issue right here. And I think that it's not a good thing for men to or people to really be insensitive to those uh, that are in these type of relationships. I think we have to be careful being insensitive. Because when you look at it, think about us as a nation. We all have been lost. We've all have been um, indoctrinated with a lot of false doctrine. You know, a belief system that's completely targeting our group, our people. Twisted turned upside down of what we view family, how we understand a family, how do we understand securing our communities, how we even understand what marriage is now. So I think we really need to have a true discussion and really stop with the trying to hurt people. You know, one thing I learned is hurt people, hurt people. We have to stop trying to Stand on a soapbox because many of those that are standing on the, the soapbox do not uh, uh, use that as an opportunity to down someone else. Hey, look, my wife, guess what? She's melanated. She's a sister. We treat we, we train our daughters. We training them up. We teach them to stay within our culture and explain it to them. Why? And I'm going to show you here of how we explain it to our daughters biblically. All right. So let's deal with this here. Let's deal with this. It's a lot that we have to deal with here tonight, but I'm going to try to keep it within two hours at the max. All right. So is it okay to marry someone from another nation? We're going to deal with that. Let's start with this word religion. What is religion? What is religion? And as you see here, I'm just going to read what's highlighted in the red piety, devotion, respect for what is sacred. All right. So that's what religion is. And so we could also take it a step further on how many carry out their belief system. Christianity is how people carry out their understanding of the scriptures. Doesn't make it right on how they bring forth their understanding. We already know that we've been the recipient on so many bad doctrines, for example, enslaving us as a community. All right. So can a person leave the church without leaving Christ or should I say the Hebrew Israelite Messiah? All right. But I want to deal with this as well. How important is identity? What does it mean to be white or black? But let's deal with this right here. What is race? This is what we really need to get a proper understanding of. Is race a nationality? Is race a nationality? Is race a nationality? We're going to answer this question. And I want to play this clip again so that way we can understand the problem within our community. Here we go again. I'm going to play this again. And so when I say Chinese, I want you to scream out the the nation that's associated with this. For example, if I say Chinese, you're gonna say what? China. 
All right, let's say it with authority. When I say Chinese, you say what? China. All right, that's just a, a test right there. So here we go. Chinese. China. Russian. Russian. Italian. Italy. German. Germany. German. Swedish. Swedish. Korean. Korea. Egyptian. Egyptian. Nigerian. I hope you were able to successfully identify the issue. And I'm sure you guys recognize the issue there. When I quoted. When I when I quoted different nationalities. They were able to tell me what country associates with them. But when I, you know, when I screamed out black. Did you see the confusion? It was almost 5000 people out there. And here you see. Most could not answer that question. Most could not answer the question of identity. And this is the problem that we're having with our community. We've been teaching as if black, that color group, is a form of nationality, which it's not. It's just a color descriptor. It's just a color descriptor. And we're going to deal with the institution of race real quick. This is coming from. Origins of the idea of race, race, the power of it, of an illusion. By Audrey Smetley, who is an anthropologist, and this is coming from the Anthropology Newsletter, November 1997. And I'm just going to read a, a couple of bullets from it. This is what it says, and the link you see is right there at the bottom. I would encourage you to read this entire this entire article. OK, so contemporary scholars agree that race was a recent invention and that it was essentially a folk idea, not a product of scientific research and discovery. This is not new to anthropologists. In other words, they knew that this whole institution of race, the way that it's designed, it is a joke. As it says here, a folk idea. This is a joke. And we still trying to fight on what's the mark of the beast. We still trying to argue and say that it's computer chips. We still trying to argue that it's so social security numbers and cards and all these different things, birth certificates. When you still embracing the institutional race. This is the system. This is the continuation of the Roman caste system. This is the renewing of that system. It's not a new world order. It's a renewed world order. And if you want to say it, improved. For the lack of better words, word selection for this. All right, let's deal with this some more. The term race which had been a classificatory term like type or kind, but with ambiguous meaning, ambiguous. That word means vague, ambiguous, vague, generalized, universal, Catholic. All of those words are interchangeable with this term ambiguous. So it says, but with ambiguous meaning, became more widely used in the 18th century and crystallized into a distinct reference for African-Americans. It gives more here. It's not just African-Americans, but I just cut it off at here. But you can read more of it. But it goes on to say, by focusing on the physical and status differences between the conquered and enslaved peoples and the Europeans. Let me read that again, because this is the basis 
of the institution of race. By focusing on the physical and status differences between the conquered and enslaved peoples and that conquered and enslaved peoples, they identify it with being the Negroes who was enslaved and the Native Americans who was here in this country who were uh, had so many different broken agreements that was made. They were conquered. And we'll deal with Thanksgiving. I'm going to deal with that, but not tonight. But again, the whole institution of race was to make sure that there is a line drawn between those who are conquered and enslaved and those who uh, enslaved them to make sure that there's a difference between the conquered and enslaved. As in the Europeans, that there's a line, there's a distinction. And every country that built this system or off of this system, I can guarantee you everywhere you go around this world that built their their whole government infrastructure off this system. The Negro is on the lowest of the to totem pole. I can guarantee you that. Look at the aboriginals in Australia. Surprisingly, you could go to Japan and you see uh, dark Asians being discriminated against. Completely caught me off guard to see that. So the emergent ideology linked the socio political status and physical traits together and created a new form of social identity. And yet we we're the main people that are saying identity doesn't matter. We're the main people that have been programmed by religion to tell up to telling us that identity does not matter. But here I'm showing you here with the institution of race. Guess what? They created an entire social identity for the entire world. Basically, they literally turned the world upside down. So they created constructs, right? Now they created these constructs, basically groups, and lumping each that they just looked at physical appearance. Oh, you got dark skin. Guess what? And you from this area? Guess what? We're going to put you under black. See, it, it goes further. It's deeper than what we can ever imagine. All right. So guess what? The, the Bible is not dealing with race like we think it is. But let's go further here. Is it OK to marry someone from another race? That's the question, right? Now, a more accurate question, because get rid of that thought of race, a more accurate question to ask. Is it OK to marry someone from another nation or marry someone from another nationality? That's what we should be asking. Let me say that again. We should be asking a more accurate question to is, is it OK to marry someone from another nation or another nationality? All right. So let's let's break this down some more. I hope you guys Grabbing hold of this because guess what? We keep we, we, we're so caught up in that construct of race. We, we are. So, and that's part of the problem because they just lump everyone just because we all are. You know, we're dark skinned doesn't mean that, you know, when I say that as a whole, when we look at Africa, you know, not all of them were from what the same nation. Africa had at least counting the Middle East, at least 70 nations. Because, you know, the Middle East, for some that don't know, is originally um, Northeast Africa. That's why his canal is a man-made canal to try to what? Separate it, bring separation to it. All right. So we're going to answer this question. I want to start off by going to Ezra chapter 10, verse one through four. I want to give some scriptures here. Now, when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed. Weeping. And casting himself down before the house of Alahayu, there assembled Quabats or Quabatzah unto him out of Israel, a very great congregation. 
And here the Hebrew word is quahal. All right. So a great congregation, a great quahal of men and women and children for the people wept very sore. And uh, Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, we have trespassed against our Elohim and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Verse three. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our Elohim to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord Adonai and of those that tremble at the at the commandment of our Allah and let it be done according to the law. Verse four, arise for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. So each Israelite was ordered to divorce his unbelieving wife, according to the law. Let me say that again. Each Israelite was ordered to divorce his unbelieving wife, according to the law. Because they were marrying foreign or strange, what, what the scripture says or what it transliterates to, uh, strange wives, strange women. What that means is foreign. And guess what? They held on to their belief system. And what was happening is that the men began to what convert over to their belief system. We're going to deal with this some more. I'm going to give you the proper clarity, the criteria of what the scripture tells us on what uh, when we're dealing with marriage. I'm going to go further in this. I'm not just going to leave you hanging on this. Let's go further. All right. The Israelite offenders were guilty of internationally or excuse me, intentionally disregarding Yahweh's edict. For selecting appropriate wives. Let me say that again. The Israelite offenders were guilty of intentionally disregarding Yahweh's edict for selecting appropriate wives. So let's go to Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Let's deal with this. All right. The Hebrew definition of Ethiopian women. Let's see what it says here. All right. Ethiopian women, right? Now you'll see it says, uh, you know, who shith, all right? So I, I'm, you know, I'm going to, again, deal with it from a ancient Hebraic pronunciation, which would be kawash yath, all right? Um, but we'll deal with it some more. We'll deal with it some more, all right? So let's deal with this here. So simply, uh, what we see here, a Kushite woman, right? Ethiopian, all right? And we see a Kushite woman. I'm bringing this, I'm going through this for a reason. Hebrew, def Hebrew definition of Ethiopian man. This is what it says. All right. And you'll see Kushi, right? Right. Or uh, Kawash Shai. All right. Well, you know, again, not, not trying to get caught up in the semantics. All right. But this is what it says. Kushi, Kushite, Ethiopian. So this is the male pronunciation of um, what you see uh, that transliterates to Ethiopian man. But notice what it says down in the sub entry. It says Kushi or Ethiopian. See Kushan, in other words, their blackness. So let's see what Kushan means. All right. And it tells us Kushan, a region of Arabia, Kushan. And then when we see down at the bottom there, you see Kushan highlighted in red, their blackness. And it goes on to say in the sub entry, a place in Arabia or Mesopotamia, sight unknown. All right. So. The Hebrew definition of Kush, right? This is the primitive root word that it comes from. All what I've mentioned to you come from. Let's see what it says. It says, Kush or Ethiopia, son of Ham and his territory, also of an Israelite. Whoa, wait a minute. Also of an Israelite, because that term Kush is not just referred to from a nationality perspective, but also it's referred to what? It can refer to what? Dark people, right? Dark melanated people. When you go to Israel right now, guess what? Kushi is actually equivalent to the N-word over there. 
they use it as an insult. I, I meant to put some clips in here, but I didn't have enough time to do that. So that way you can actually see for yourself. All right. But let's deal with this some more. Let's deal with this some more. All right. Let's deal with this some more. All right. Let's see. Let's deal with this some more. And uh, and again, guys, let's be let's be uh, really respectful in the. Um, you know, if we really go through, you know, let's be very respectful in the chat. All right. Because people are watching us. Let's not go back and forth with, you know, with things that we can just uh, deal with at the end. Because, again, I ask you guys, you know, with respect, just watch the full. I mean, just pay attention to what I'm, I'm going to bring out to the fullness of it. Do not get distracted by um, the chat. Pay attention to what I'm, I'm sharing with you. All right. You know, and, um, uh, you know, in this way, we could really take down the layers here. All right. So it says here, Cush equals what? Black. OK, so Aaron and Miriam issue with Moses wife was not based on the color of her skin. It was based on culture. Let me say that again. Aaron and Miriam's, in other words, Moses, uh, brother and sister, his older brother and sister. Their issue with Moses uh, or their concerns with Moses about his wife. It was not based on color, the color of her skin. Why? Because as I already proved. That Moses, and we already know, Moses was a melanated man. He was a Negro. Right. So all of them were dark. All right. So let's let's prove this. So it was not based on on skin complexion. It was based on culture. So let's deal with this some more, both Israelites and the Ethiopians. And we can also throw in the Israelites. We could, I mean, not Israelites, um, the Egyptians. We could throw in the original um, um, descendants of Esau, the Edomites, and we could throw others up in here. We're originally dark skinned. Until now, you see, most of that has been whitewashed. <laughs> but anyway, let's go to Amos chapter nine, verse seven. You guys already know this. But I want to just reiterate this for those that may not. This is coming from the uh, translation of the scriptures, which is um, a Jewish translation. Right. The prophets Nevin, a new translation of the Holy Scriptures. And you're going to see here they're going to prove my point here. OK, let's see what it says to me. O Israelites, you are what? Just like the Ethiopians declares the Lord. So what are they telling you here? They are telling us that the Israelites look just like the Ethiopians in their appearance. Right. According to scripture. And the Tanakh, this is what it says. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians and to me, O uh, children of Israel? Now, you see, it put it more um, as a question, but no, way, no matter what, they cannot get around it. That guess what? Going back here. <laughs> right. Right. And you'll see if you see the older Tanakh translation, you'll see that it reads just like this right here that I have up on your screen. To me, O Israelites, you are just like the Ethiopians. That word like means having the characteristics of the Ethiopians. Right. And so what is what is the characteristics of the Ethiopians? I showed you Kush, dark skin. OK. This is the Peshitta. Behold, you are like the Ethiopians to me, O children of Israel. You see that word like again. In other words, having the characteristics of the Ethiopians in terms of their, their appearance. OK, not saying this from a belief system. This is saying from what? The appearance, the physical appearance. All right. So a more accurate question again to ask is, is it OK to marry someone from another nation or nationality? That's the true question. Let's go to Genesis chapter three, verse 15. Let's go here. And, I, and I'm, I'm the reason why I'm taking you little by little is because I want to make sure that I give you proper clarity. And then if you have questions at the end, I don't have a problem with answer, answering those questions. But we want to make sure that we get proper clarity and make sure that we are sens uh, sensitive, be more sensitive and and, you know, to how we address this among our, our, our other brothers and sisters that may be in uh, mixed relationships or thinking about getting into uh, another relationship with another what nation. Even Apostle Paul deals with this in Corinthians. 
All right. But let's let's deal with this here. Genesis chapter three, verse 15. This is a key prophecy. And and I will put enmity. And in other words, I abide means um, active hostility between thee and the woman and between thy seed, Zarai, and her seed, Zarai. That's the Hebrew word for seed. And it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. I place this here for a reason. I will put enmity. Enmity means active hostility. And we see that it says between what? The seeds of the serpent and the seed of the woman. That's a key prophecy. So uh, I, I, I should have taken this out. I, I, I shrunk down this presentation for the sake of um, tonight. So did the white man write the Bible? We know the white man did not write the Bible. That's what many arguments that the conscious community uh, false claims that they make. So this is this presentation for the um, the Moore's presentation. I shrunk it down just for the sake of addressing this issue. So this question is really from a, a larger presentation. All right. But we know that they didn't. What color is the Hebrew Israelite Messiah? Guess what? We already know. I covered that. Uh, we know that he was a dark mel uh, melanated Hebrew. He was not Arab. He was not uh, what you call it. Um, um, olive in terms of the unripe olive. OK, so what is a more we're going to deal with? We're going to deal with some of this tonight. So the Moors, Right. And I want to make this clear. I'm not trying to disrespect anyone that that may follow that may follow the Moors science. I'm strict. I'm dealing strictly with doctrine. Because I dealt with a lot of Moors out here in Richmond, Virginia. Why? Because a lot of them, there, there's a lot of that that's embracing these teachings. And this is. What this is how I approach them. I go right into the scriptures. Right. And I'm going to deal with doctrine here. I'm not going to go too uh, far with, um, you know, dealing with the Mussolini and all that other stuff. But we want to keep it simple here. So the Moors teach that all Negroes are Moors. But let's deal with the etymology of the word more. Let's see what it means. It says North Africa. Berber. One of the race dwelling in Barbary. Right. But does it really give us a lot of information? Let's see here. We see Moros. Right. Black. Right. So you can also look at that term more being used interchangeably with the word black, dark skin. It also goes on and says, I'll say this also applied to the Arabic conquerors of Spain. All right. Being a dark people in relation to Europeans and their name in the Middle Ages was synonym a synonym for Negro. All right. So we're going to deal with this some more. All right. We're going to deal with this some more. We're going to break down this some more because we are going to see a distinction and I'm going to show you the, the distinction um, later. So this is the circle seven Quran, right? Or the Holy Quran of the Moorish science temple of America. And I'm using this for a reason. And you guys going to get you, you guys grab hold of it. Why I'm using the Moors as, as an example. Because this is what I use when I'm dealing with the Moors out here. All right. This version of the Quran comes from Levi Dowell's Aquarium Gospel. I'm going to be real with you. This version of the Quran, their version, right? Noble Drew Ali took his information, took <laughs> his version of the Quran directly from Levi Dowell's Aquarium Gospel. All right. So. This is giving you some, you know, some some information from within here. But I did this for a reason. This is coming from the Circle 7 Quran, page 98. Write this down, guys, because I'm going to show you why I'm sharing this with you. It's under the section that says divine origin of the Asiatic Asiatic nations. And under number two, paragraph two, it says the key of. The key of civilization was and is in the hand of the Asiatic nations. The Moorish, who were ancient Moabites. Wait a minute. The Moorish, who were what? Ancient Moabites. Now make a note of that line right there. It's in red for a reason. And the founders of the holy city of what? Mecca. So write that down, guys. Make it make a note of that right there. The Moorish, who were ancient Moabites. Make a note of that. So the Moors in their literature, 
they say that they are the ancient descendants of the ancient Moabites. So the question is, who are the Moabites? And this is still going to tie into the overall subject tonight. Who are the Moabites? Let's go to Genesis chapter 19, verse 31 and 32. Let's see what the scripture says about the Moabites. It says in the firstborn, and this is dealing with Lot and his two daughters after they have fled out of um, the metropolitan of Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything was decimated. Now you have Lot and his two daughters living inside a cave. All right. So that's the backdrop to this right here. All right. And they seduce their own father. All right. Let's see what it says. And the firstborn said to unto the younger. Our father is old and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. All right. So in their mind, this can you can easily take this that the daughters are under this impression that the entire world had come to an end. And now it's just them and their father. All right. So, again, it says, come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. All right. Let's go further with this. Genesis, you know, um, verse 36 and 37. All right. It says, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Here's the kicker. And the firstborn bear a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. Wait a minute. So when these guys say that they are descendants of the ancient Moabites. OK, so you're saying that you are a descendant by way of Moab, the daughter uh, uh, or the grandson of Lot by way of his own daughter. Leviticus chapter 18, verse seven and eight. Let's see what it says. Let's go to this law right here. It says the nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother. Shalt thou not uncover? She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shall not. Thou shalt not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Now, I'm showing you this for a reason, because this is going to tie back into the Moabites. This is going to ultimately answer your question with the scriptures on whether or not it is OK to marry outside of our nation, outside of our nationality. Notice I did not say race. So here's a fact. This law existed prior to the birth of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Let me say that again. The law that I just read to you from Leviticus, this law existed prior prior to the birth of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Let's go to Genesis chapter nine, verse twenty one through twenty five. And we're going to give clarity and it's all going to tie in together. And he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered with his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, was excuse me, saw the nakedness of his father and and told his father two brethren without. Now we're going to deal with that word nakedness of his father. What does that mean? The nakedness of his father. Let's go back to Leviticus. Let me go back here. Let me go back here. This is the law right here. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Now here's the kicker. The nakedness of thy father's wife. Shall thou not uncover? It is thy father's nakedness. So nakedness means nude. It means unclothed. Right. So uncovering um, the, the nakedness of thy father is actually what? Referring to his wife, not to Noah himself. For example, I'm going to show you that and I'm going to prove this here. All right. So we building this up. Let's go back at Genesis 9, verse 21 through 25. It says this. And he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent and ham. His actual name is Ham. I'm saying that for a reason, because you have some people trying to teach that Abraham, his name is a mixture of the Israelites and the Egyptians. That's completely incorrect. Right. No, 
because uh, that's what they try to justify and say, hey, look, Israel's are originally Cushites. That's completely incorrect. Right. The Hebrew word for ham that that trans, uh, that the word ham transliterates from is ham. All right. And you will not see a ka inside Abraham's name. OK. But nevertheless, his original name or his 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 um, his biblical name, according to ancient Hebrew, nor will you find it in um, is the Israeli language or what others refer to modern Hebrew. But nevertheless, let's let's deal with this some more. So in Ham, the father of Canaan saw what the nakedness of his father, meaning he saw what his mother naked. This say, this is saying that he had an, an inappropriate relationship an incest relationship with his own mother. And it says and told his two brother brethren without it goes on to say. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and uncovered and covered the nakedness of their father. Because guess what? They're men. They're men. <laughs> they, they are men. The shame is not seeing your own father uh, exposed. The shame is seeing your own mother exposed. The shame is uh, understanding what uh, 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 Ham or Ham had done to his own mother. It says in their faces were backwards. Why? Because it says, and they saw not their father's nakedness. In other words, their mother, his father's wife, their father's wife. They did not see her naked. They did not see her in, nude, in the nude, exposed. And Noah awoke from his wine and what and knew what his younger son had done unto him. See, and the uh, many would teach this as if Noah and his, his son did something um um, performed a and home a homosexual act on him like he violated his father physically this is not the case actually he had an inappropriate relationship with his mother and this is why it answers the question for verse 25 and he said cursed be canaan didn't say cursed be ham he cursed what the seed why did he curse the seed going back to genesis um 3 and 15 Right. The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. It, he and he said, curse be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto his brethren. So why did Noah curse Canaan? <laughs> I'm, we, we're getting into this. Canaan was conceived through incest. Cain, Canaan was conceived through incest. So the biblical Moabites are children conceived through incest. Let's deal with this Hebrew word here, mamzer or mamzar, right? It means this from an unused root meaning to alienate a mongrel. In other words, a hybrid. That's what mongrel means, a hybrid. An example born of a Jewish father and a heathen mother. And you see the term bastard. See, our women within our community that turn bastard or, or bastard child, that term has been that label has been placed on the women. We need to stop. We need to stop this, uh, allowing people to humiliate our women. It started back with when you start looking at the Republican Party back back on um, around the time of the Reagan administration. They came up with the term welfare queen where uh, uh, to suggest that the women within our community are we um, are um, taking advantage of welfare, abusing the system where truth be told. Right. You have far more Caucasians on welfare than our community. You, you can even look it up. The Jewish community up in New Jersey. Right. In New York, they had a million dollar scheme going on of abusing what welfare. All right. But let's 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 deal with this some more. Right. So this term bastard, that's an incorrect term that should it should never be associated with our women. OK. And don't even refer to yourself as a bastard seed or, or a bastard child, because if you do, you're saying that you are what? A child of what? Incest. But notice the deception here. Born of a Jewish father and a heathen mother. Remember when I did the teaching. And if you guys want, if you have another browser that you could pull up, do the etymology of the word pagan. Right. Um, and I guarantee you it's going to surprise you. Because when you see that term heathen, right, it's going to tell you that that term heathen 
when you read it, especially when you read it in scripture, when you see heathen, it's actually referring to what? According to their doctrine, according to the Europeans, they view the heathens as being what? Uncivilized, barbaric. The term pagan is referred to what they deem to be civilized communities, civil, civilized countries that what? Do not believe in the scriptures like the Romans, the Greeks and even the, the Muslims. OK, so let's deal with this some more. Let's deal with this some more. All right. So what is a Jew? This is the contradiction. All right. This is the contradiction. This is coming from the law of return. The definition of a Jew. This is coming from their own site, the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Look at this. And you see law of return 5710-1950. Right. And let's see what it says. Under 4B, it says for the purpose of this law, Jew means a person who was born of a Jewish mother or has become converted to Judaism and who is not a member of another religion. So they define being Jewish, right? Is what? Uh, someone that is birthed from a Jewish mother, from a Jewish mother. Doesn't matter who the father is, but birthed to a Jewish mother. But guess what? That's the Jewish community. I'm not dealing with the Jewish community. We're dealing with Israelites, right? Because remember that term Jew in the 16th century, this is where they began to put all these secondary meanings on it. So we all are Israelites. And as I pointed out over and over again, page three of the Jewish Almanac, it tells you that uh, we should not be taking that term Jew and using it interchangeably with Israel. Right. It tells you that in, in the very first paragraph on page three of the Jewish Almanac. So this is some of the confusion right here. But let's move forward here. Let's go to the law of incest, the law of children of incest that I refer to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse two and three. Let's see what it says. It says a bastard mama czar, right? Or mom czar, as you see there, mom czar, right? That's what we said. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation. In other words, the, uh, the quahal, the assembly of Yahweh, even to his 10th generation, he shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh, the Quahal of Yahweh. Why is that? But no, notice this right here. I want you to pay attention to this. And we, we, we answered the question, but I got to walk you through. Verse three, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh, even to their 10th generation. Shall they not enter into the congregation? In other words, the Quahal of Yahweh forever. What, is, what does it say forever? Why? Because remember what I said, the Ammonites and the Moabites are what? They are children of. Children of incest. Children of incest. So I want to answer this question. I'm answering that question about marrying outside the nation, outside of your nationality. Right. I'm answering this question, but I'm what? Systematically walking you through the process. OK, here we go. Again, the Ammonite and the Moabite had a history in going against the children of Israel. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23 through 25. Right. Let me bring that up here. In those days, because remember, Ezra had to uh, present this to the people and they ended up what? Annulling marriages. But we see this right here, written right in the book in um, Nehemiah. And look at what is listed there. It says in those days. Also saw I Judah that had married wives of Ashad, Ammon, and of who? Moab. Right? You see, children of what? Let me ask that question. Children of what? Incest. As well as what? When we look at also two idols, idol worshiping, but we see incest here with Moab, definitely. And Ammon, the Ammonites. All right. Ashad, right? That's that, you know. Now, of course, he um those descendants are not of Lot, but this is also dealing with what? Idol worshiper. Those that are idol worshiping. And so the men began to what? Disregard their own heritage. And they began to do like Solomon did, began to what? Take on the practices of the women that they were marrying. So it goes on here, verse 24, and their children spake half in speech of Ashad and could not speak in the language of um, Judah's language, but according to the language of each people. 
So Judah, the, the, the generation that Nehemiah saw, he had to have a translator to speak to them. Why is this important? Every single letter is a syllable in the Hebraic alphabet, right? Every letter has a meaning. You change one letter, you change the law. You change one letter, you change the, the most high Yah, right? You change any letter, you change any of that. And, and what, what's the problem here is that the children of Israel, that newer generation, would not be able to understand the importance of the law, statutes, and commandments, which we see today. Especially if all you know is what? Uh, the English language. If you don't understand Hebrew or making it a, 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 an assertive effort to understand the text from the lens of the Hebraic people, then you're going to fall up under the doctrine of what? The Europeans, you're going to put a Catholic spin on the scriptures always. So, again, the children could not speak the language, their native tongue, the language of their fathers. All right. Verse 25. And I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by Allah. I am saying ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. All right, let me let me get to some more, right? Why am I sharing all of this? Because I'm answering that question. Go to 83rd book of Psalms, and I'm going to break this down and show you why, you know, you have to be conscientious of who you call yourself marrying, uh, whether you, if you're dealing with, uh, let's just say, skin complexion, or if you're dealing with the ethnicity, you have to understand the culture, Right. Just because you see someone, um, let's just say over in Africa and you marry them because of just their skin complexion, you could be what? Co-signing or signing up for a belief system that completely contradicts yours. And that's what we're dealing with right now. That's the criteria. But let's go here. The 83rd book of Psalms, verse one through seven. Let me pull this up here. I'm going here for a reason. It says, keep not thou silence, O Allah, hold not thy peace. And what? Be not still, O Allah, for lo, thy enemies make a tumult. In other words, a hama, a war cry. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against who? Thy hidden ones. Again, every last one of you guys that's watching. The, right. My brothers and sisters, you are the hidden ones. Guess what? When you start understanding and see we, it's being revealed and confirmed, even with our DNA testing that my uh, my cousin, Pastor William Brown, revealed that what we are Israelites. And guess what? Limbers are not the only one. That's why I showed that rabbi. He mentioned Igbo. He mentioned other tribes. There are other tribes, even in our DNA listing from Jed Match, that confirms that we are Israelites. So guess what? We are the hidden ones. We are the ones that they came together, this crafty council, right, that we are witnessing even today to what completely erase who we are, the reputation of us. But let me let me go further here. Let me read the scripture and we'll, we'll break it down here. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being what a nation, the hidden one that's scattered all around this world. Come, let us cut them off from what being a nation. What is the foundation? What is the pillars of what constitutes a nation of being a nation land? They took away our land and carried us to a foreign land. That's where you get to turn rapture from. It means raped. Right. It means what uh, to uh, kidnap carry away. They have raped our people. We, we have been raptured. We are the descendants of rapture. We are prisoners at war. Let us cut them off by what? Being a nation that the name. Now, understand this, guys. This is why it's important to understand Hebrew. The Hebrew word for name, and I'm just going to say it from the ancient pronunciation, is sham. And sham means it could be a literal name, but also it means what? Reputation. It means what? Fame, glory, character. So to completely what? Take the, the name, the reputation, the character, what Israel was known for to completely remove it from our people. It says the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together one consent with one consent, Akkad, one consent. 
They are confederate against the confederate. Right. That is what covenant. It tra- you know, you see covenant. You also see um, constitution. You'll see alliance. That's what confederate means. So when you see the confederacy here in the country, right? I mean, here in this um, the United States, the confederacy, that's saying what an agreement and alliance, the constitution agreement, alliance. So you have the Constitution and you have the Confederate. That's still those are words that are interchangeable. It's just that the southern right of the United States, right um, below the Mason Dixie line, they refer to themselves as the Confederate, while the North was what fighting what for what the Constitution. But both of them still what means that uh, alliance. All right. So they are Confederate against thee. OK, verse six, the tabernacles of who? Edom, pay attention to these names, Edom and the Ishmaelites, right? This will tell you why, give you more understanding why uh, Ishmael, I mean, not Ishmael, but Isaac was disappointed, why he was upset with his son Esau, because not only because he married multiple wives, but he also married what? Uh, The daughters of his uncle Ishmael, all right? But notice the, the crafty counsel here. You see Edom, you see the Ishmaelites, the descendants of Ishmael. You see, notice here, Moab, Hagarines, in other words, descendants of Hagar, Jebel. And you see who? Ammon, Moab, Ammon. These are two what? Uh, uh, descendants. These are descendants of what? Of what I pointed out, incest. That, that always made it a point to have cause a problem with the Israelites. All of these groups. You see Amalek. That's, you know, the, uh, the Amal- uh, Amalekites, but Amalek, the descendants of Amalek. You'll understand this in Exodus um, chapter 19. One of the worst wars that Israel had to fight. Why? Because the uh, descendants of Esau, right, the Am- uh, Amalek, right, gave the command for them to what? Attack Israel from behind as they were what? Transitioning out of Egypt and en- en- route to the promised land. You see the Philistines with the with Tyria, the inhabitants of Tyre. So we see the crafty council there. So the Moors were conceived through incest, as I brought out, and they are part of the council to destroy the hidden ones of Israel. So, again, so why would you want to marry someone that's in covenant to do what? To destroy your own people. Why would you want to marry the seeds? That's what I'm I'm going here for a reason. I want you guys to understand this. Right. What it really means. Is it okay to marry someone from another nation? You have to know the history of that nation. See, we've been so blinded that we don't we don't even uh, we, we deal with black, but we don't deal with the ethnicity that that's associated with it. We don't uh, we, we don't deal with nation nationality. We've been institutionalized to think of what just that construct while other cultures, they deal with what their, eth- their, their ethnicity, they deal with their nationality. We've been programmed not to deal with nationality because through these religious system of Christianity and um, Christian down, which is still Catholic, all of them still one. We've been taught that it doesn't matter why it matters to others. Even in the Spanish community. Right. You you got Spanish uh, um, far as Puerto Ricans. Right. They get mad at you if, uh, if they're women, um, not all of them, but many of them get mad if they're women mixing with an, a Negro. They get mad if they're women mixing with a Cub- a Cuban or Cubana. Right. Y'all know what I'm talking about, especially if you're from up the, up the way. They get mad. You know, you got Koreans that get mad at those that are interacting with Chinese or uh, Japanese. Right. Even though to you, it may not look like it's a different, but it is a difference among them. They make the distinction. All right. So the Moors were conceived through incest and they are part of the council to destroy the hidden ones of Israel. OK, so the doctrine of the Moors, let's deal with this some more. The Circle 7 Quran or the Holy Quran of the Moors Science Temple of America. Let's just highlight a couple of things that they teach. Right. Just so you get an understanding of this. Right. They say this here, the beginning of Christianity. Number two, paragraph two, Jesus himself was of the true blood of the ancient Canaanites and what Moabites and the inhabitants of Africa. (laughs) Right. You see what you see what I'm going at with. This is why I'm highlighting the Moors. Now, paragraph three, seek to redeem his people. In those days, from the pressure of the pale skinned nations of Europe. 
Rome crucified, fight, excuse me, crucified him according to, you know, and I, you know, I'm not going into all of that, but you get the gist of it. But this is what else they say here. The end of time and the fulfilling of the of the prophecies. This is what they teach. This is in the Circle 7 Quran. It says John the Baptist was the front of the forerunner of Jesus in those days to warn and stir up the nation and prepare them to receive the divine creed, which was taught by Jesus. It goes on to say, paragraph three, and those in these modern days, there came a forerunner of Jesus who was divinely prepared by the great God Allah. And his name is what? You see what it says? Marcus Garvey. They're saying that Marcus Garvey is the John the Baptist to Noble Drew Ali. Who, te who did teach and warn the nations of the earth to prepare to meet the coming prophet who was to bring the true and divine creed of Islam. And his name is Noble Drew Ali. I'm not making this up. You can get the reference. You can see here. I I'm showing you references. Right. Noble Drew Ali, who was prepared and sent by. I mean, sent to this earth by Allah to teach the old time religion and the everlasting gospel to the sons of men that every nation shall and must worship under their own vine and fig tree and return to their own and be one of their fathers that um, be one of their father, God, Allah. All right. So also in the circus, circle, um, excuse me, circle seven Quran. Uh, which is also referred to the Holy Quran of the more science temple of America. They teach that Christ was taught. Um, Brahmic was taught by a Brahmic priest in India. Let me show you this here. This is what they say. And this is still tying into what the, this part is tying into what the Aquarian, the Aquarian gospel. But this is what it says. The, Bra the Brahmic priests were glad to welcome home. The prince with favor. They received the Jewish boy. And Jesus was accepted as a pupil in the temple of um, Jagannath. And here he learned the Vedas and the Manic law. So who, who is uh, Brahma? Who, who are they? Let me bring this up real quick. All right. Andy's patriarchal God, whose priests tried to establish a uh, holy male dominated society and eliminate the mother goddess who never who, who nevertheless remained to excuse me, nevertheless remained the parent of Brahma as she was of the other gods, though some of Brahma's scriptures try to disassociate him from the mother by calling him the birthless. Yet the same scriptures, in other words, their their writings, their doctrines. When I say scriptures, this is not dealing with our our holy text, right? Their text, right? Right. The same scriptures, their same scriptures, right? And congruously um, refer to him as the goddess's firstborn. All right. So, which leads me to the question of who is Allah? Let me give you clarity on Allah, so we can bring this all all together. Does the Muslims serve the same Yah? We got to be real. Absolutely not. Why? Because um, Islam in its earliest form, when we understand that whole territory, Mecca and that whole territory, there was over 360 different forms of idol worshiping or we could say paganistic um, or pagan idolatry uh, religions. It was one. It was a religion for each day. So but nevertheless, this uh, doesn't uh, does the Muslim serve the same Yah? All right. Guess what? They worshiped a goddess. This is the goddess that the earlier Muslims worshiped. Right. And this is not trying to disrespect anyone, but we have to be real. The late Islamic masculization of the Arabian goddess is Alat or Al Elat, the Alatu of the Babylonians, formerly worshiped at the Kaaba in Mecca. It has been shown that. The Allah of Islam was a male transformation of the primitive lunar deity of Arabia. Lunar. And now you're dealing with what? 360. Right. We can even get into the Freemasons and all of that stuff. Right. But nevertheless, the primitive lunar de deity of Arabia, her ancient symbol, the crescent moon, which they still use today. The crescent moon still appear on Islamic flags, even though modern Muslims no longer emit any feminine symbolism. Whatever connected with the holy patriarchal Allah, you know, they, 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 that's who they actually worshiped <laughs> a lot. Okay. So the Moabites 
and the Ammonites, they are not the only nations of Israel who were forbidden to marry. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. The Moabites and the Ammonites are not the only nations that were forbidden to uh, uh, to uh, for it, the Israelites to marry. All right. All right. So let's let, let's go further here. Let's deal with this some more. Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse one through four. This is why I'm highlighting nations, because, you know, I can't say race. We have to deal with nations. Right. We have to deal with uh, nationalities. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse one through four. This is important. Right. Not just the Moabites, not just the Ammonites. But now we're going to see some more here. When Yahweh Allah shall bring thee into the land. This is Israel getting ready to go into the promised land. Understand the entire book of Deuteronomy is a series of instructions, a series of messages of the Most High using Mo Moses to prepare the generation that are descendants of that generation that died in the wilderness. Now they're getting ready to give, give um, um, Moses through the Most High is going to give the people the keys to the city. But now he's preparing them or what to expect when they go there. So here in verse um, chapter seven, verse one, when Yahweh Allah Hayim, some of you guys will say um, when you say um, when I say Allah Hayim, that's the ancient pronunciation that transliterates to God. Some of you guys will say Elohim. All right. But I'm not getting into all that. But nevertheless, when Yahweh Allah Hayim shall bring thee into the land, where that thou goest to possess it. Notice that's what I just pointed out and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when Yahweh Allah shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant. Notice what it says. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them because they are the enemies. Going back to my point, why would you want to marry those that have what come into counsel to destroy your people? I'm, I'm, let me say that again. Why would we want to what marry someone that have what uh, uh, descendants of those that have what purposed in their heart that they're going to destroy our people? But many have done that by not knowing. See, this is why we have to have what compassion towards our people. M many don't know. Most of us don't know what I'm sharing with you. And I can guarantee you, you, you go talk to any pastor inside the church right now. Most of them are not going to know. I, I will say easily 97 percent of them will not know what I'm sharing with you in the fullness of how I'm sharing it with you. I could go even higher with that. Will not know this right here. So that's why I said we have to have more compassion when we're dealing with our people and we need to stop having these rebels who call themselves teaching the word, trying to tell somebody, you know, hey, this is what you better not do. Not having no compassion, kind of like that David syndrome. You know, when David, you know, thought that somebody else that Naaman was dealing with, he thought he was dealing with somebody else to his example of, uh, that he gave David about how a farmer got uh, basically took somebody else's um, um um, bull or whatever, David said, Hey, you know, that person deserves death. But then once Ne uh, Naaman said to him, you know what? That person is you. All of a sudden now David ready to tap dance. Now David is in a tough, tough pickle because why he declared death for that person that he thought, um, did something tragic, did something evil. But then when it was flipped on him, now he's, now he's changing his tune. See, we got to stop. Stop doing that, people. Just because you're not in the middle of that situation doesn't mean that you cannot have compassion for that person. Come on now. You got to be real with this. We got to have compassion with this because I've seen quite a few people soapbox with this and not really um, teaching the scriptures in the proper context. We see the Deuteronomy curses right among our people. Most of us don't know what I'm teaching you here. Most of us, guess what? This is a sticker shock with what I'm teaching. I know for sure most didn't even know that um, the incest laws were there. That what I just explained to you of uh, how I'm having an inappropriate relationship with his mother. All right. So let's 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 be show some compassion here. Mightier than thou. And when Yahweh 
Thy Allah shall deliver them before thee. Thou shalt smite them and utterly what? Destroy them. Thou shalt make what? No covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. It goes on to say, verse three, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take up to uh, take unto thy son. Right. It goes on to say, for they will re they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods, other other uh, uh, Allahians or Baalim, which is the plurality of the um, the Baal, the Baal worships, the Baal of the, the sky or the air, the Baal of the rocks or the earth, the Baal of the wind and the Baal of the water and the Asherith and all that other stuff the groves and all that other stuff for they will turn away thy son from me, from following me that they may serve other, what other gods. So will the anger of Yahweh be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. All right. So that's what we have to understand. And when you really read the book of Deuteronomy, especially when you start getting into divination and all those things that is telling you, this is what these countries, these nations that was occupying the land of Canaan. This is what they were indulging in. And yet you see that our people through these religious systems are what being um, um, deceived in embracing Christmas, embracing Easter, embracing Halloween, embracing Thanksgiving, embracing uh, Ash Wednesday, embracing Valentine's Day, embracing uh, the, the uh, St. Valentine. Um, what's that? No, St. Patrick's Day. All these different things that is a complete contradiction of what thus says the most high. Why? Because they're serving other gods. They serving another God, not the most high. So these seven nations were larger and more powerful than the Israelites. They knew that these were enemies. The enemy possessed a serious, uh, they posed a serious threat to the Israelites. A carefully, excuse me, a careful, well thought out strategy was needed to defeat the enemies. But even more than the strategy, the presence of Yahweh, because his because his leadership and his guidance is very much needed. His Holy Spirit. We need his Holy Spirit. We need the, the Hebrew Israelite Messiah. We need this. We need them in our lives. So let's deal with the works of another crafty council. Let's deal with the works of another crafty council. Let me say that. Say this again. Let me deal with the works of another crafty council. And we're going to wrap this up here because I should have. Uh, hopefully you guys caught it by now. Right. You know, so far we laid out the enemies and I'm going to lay out more enemies and we should not be what taking our children and embracing the very ones that have what. Entered this this council to what, uh, as I pointed out, to completely er uh, erase. The hidden ones to erase the Israelites as it, uh, the reputation from being associated with the true people. So the works of another crafty council, let's deal with this real quick. You guys know this, but I got to keep reiterating this for those that may not know this slavery and the Catholic Church. OK, this is page um, uh, 52 and 53. Right. Popple grants the king of Portugal giving authority to enslave Saracens and other non-Christians of West Africa, whom Christendom is at war. So understand this guy, Christendom, uh, Catholicism, Christianity, all of those were interchangeable. Right. All of those are interchangeable. That's a whole nother discussion. But notice what it says. Christendom is at what war? We have to understand, guys. This is a war. We have to get beyond. I keep saying the transatlantic slave trade. It was a transatlantic world war. We got to stop talking about World War Three. World War Three already occurred. World War Three already occurred. Especially if you add the transatlantic world war. Far more died. Were murdered. During the transatlantic world war. This crafty council. That is a world war, but we we've been taught to what? Not even included. Just call it a slave trade. We got to change. We got to change our approach, guys. And if um, our brothers and sisters that are in the church, 
I, I, I challenge you to go deeper in your studies and understand what what and why things are done a certain way. Why you wear those white gloves during the, the Holy Communion? Why you wear those white gloves? Understand why you wear the regalia that you wear. Because if you understand why you wear those white gloves, that was to show the the the, um, the slave owner who is watching over the assembly, you know, our assemblies or if we were in assembly with them to make sure that um, we had the white gloves on. So that way, it can, guess what? We, they can tell whether or not if we're stealing anything. Also, they did not want to touch us. But to make sure that we're not stealing anything to make it easier to detect. But yet, guess what? That has become a part of a ritual. That's what it is. It's a ritual. Because that is not what the last uh, supper was all about. It was all about what? The Passover. They were celebrating the Passover. The Hebrew Israelite Messiah and his disciples, as well as all of Israel, was honoring the Passover. So know your history. Go deeper. Don't just depend on what's being spoon fed to you. Go deeper. So, again, Christendom is at war. In 1442, a Portuguese captain brought to the Gold Coast some Moorish prisoners of war, exchanged them for 10 Negro slaves. Notice it's making a distinction. The Moors, the Negroes, and we see the Saracens. We see Portuguese. We also see what? Christendom, which is in interchangeable with what? The, the Catholic Church, the church as a whole, Christianity, Catholics, all of them are lumped up under there. And if we want, we could put Judaism up in there as well. OK, but notice what it said. Go back here for 10 Negro slaves. Exchange them for what? 10 Negro slaves. So that means that our ancestors were enslaved. To the Moors. We were enslaved to the Arabs. We were enslaved. And you will see history with the Moors. Guess what? And all our captivities, guess what? The Moors played a major role in that, especially when you understand the transatlantic slave trade, how the uh, the, the Portuguese were finding where we were uh, finding out our locations and when to come and what raid our our territories, raid our villages because the Moors knew. Anyway, let's deal with this some more. Let's wrap this up here and brought these back to Lisbon, which is a trading settlement was established at Lagos. By 1444, it would appear by that by 1452, the Portuguese were anxious to establish their property rights over their newly discovered West African territories. The property rights, that's the same thing that Christopher Columbus uh, operated under. That's what all of them were operating under to declare territories that was never there. Like someone coming up to your house telling you, guess what? That that's their house. You don't own your house anymore. They were given uh, rights to take your home. That's what was happening here. But nevertheless, let's give, go further here. Let, let's deal with this here. I don't want to get sidetracked. But it would appear that by 1452, the Portuguese were anxious to establish their property rights over their newly discovered West African territories. And so Pope Nicholas V was approached and was apparently led to believe that these territories of the of the Guinea coast were inhabited by Saracens and other enemies of Christendom. There is no other explanation of a series of papal documents which applied the well-known contemporary rules of what? The rules of war to the situation where in West Africa they applied the rules of war. We need to, I'm telling you guys this. We need to wake up. We need to wake up. We need to wake up on how we're understanding history. Man, it's sad what, what, what has become of Israel. You can understand and get a proper understanding of Revelation chapter one, as well as chapter two, when it talks about the eyes, flaming fire of the Hebrew Israelite Messiah. In other words, the intensity that's in his eyes for what he has seen happen to his people. See what we have become. Well, we are under this deception, this suppressive system that is called the institution of race. Under these religious systems of Christianity. Catholicism, Judaism, Islam, all of them enslaved our people, these systems, they are the crafty council, and yet we still pushing their doctrines. 
There is no other explanation of a series pop of popple documents which applied the well-known contemporary rules of war to the situation in West Africa, whereas the Portuguese were well aware that the local Negro inhabitants were not Saracens. They knew exactly who they were going after, were not Muslims and were not enemies of Christian. Now, so if we were not Saracens, and I'm explaining to you what that is, we're not Muslims and we're not the enemies of Christian. Now, guess what? That tells you they knew that we were, that we are, and our ancestors was, uh, was Israelites, descendants of Israel. As you see, countless numbers of documentation to prove that. So, so many of our brothers and sisters are putting so much time and effort to, sh to show you these documents. These documents that's giving you proper clarity of the Spanish Inquisition. We're not Saracens, we're not Muslims, and we're not the enemies of Christendom. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V addressed a brief uh, to King Alfonso V of Portugal, which included the following words. I didn't go into all of that, but you can see more of it inside that document. But nevertheless, the local Negro inhabitants were not Saracens. They were not Muslims. That's a key quote. So who are the Saracens as we get ready to wrap this up? All right. The Saracens. Notice what it says. In the Middle Ages, any person, Arab, Turk, or other who profess the religion of Islam. Wait a minute. So they knew that uh, the slaves that they were taking out of West Africa, they were not uh, Arabs. They were not Turks and they were not professing the religions of Islam. Even though you still had a few on the ship. I'm not I'm, I'm not going to downplay that. You still had some of that on there. But overall, they were specifically targeting targeting our people. Right. But it goes on to say here early in the Roman earlier in the Roman world, there had been references to Saracens by late classical authors in the first three centuries A.D., the term being then applied to Arab tribe living in the Sinai Peninsula. All right. So the Saracens are Arabs. They are Turks. OK, so wrapping this up. Right. Let's go to Africa labors for a new empire, Iberia slavery and the Atlantic world. OK, this is going to just reinforce what I already read, but I'm just going to read it anyway. So Portuguese mariners began to return to Iberia with captives acquired in West Africa and West Central Africa. Notably, the treatment of black Gentiles was addressed in 1452 and 1455 when Pope Nicholas V issued a series of papal bulls that granted Portugal the right to enslave sub-Saharan Africans. Church leaders argued that slavery served as a natural deterrent and Christianizing influence to barbarous, barbarous behavior among pagans. Notice they called us what bar barbarians. Using this logic, Pope, the Pope issued a mandate to the Portuguese king, Alfonso V. And guess what? Just gave him instructions to do what? For, uh, uh, to carry out these instructions, enslaving our people based off what is called the agreement, what is called the Asiento. I didn't put all of that up in here, but guess what? That's that Asiento is an agreement. It's a constitution that these nations came together and did what? Agreed to enslave our people, how they were what? Uh, you know, dividing the spoils per se. So Pope, it, Pope Nicholas, again, issued a mandate to the Portuguese King Alfonso V and instructed him, right? Understand the Pope. Right. If you understand the, the, the system of the uh, Catholicism, the Pope, they teach that the Pope had power in both realms, the temporal and spiritual. Temporal means what? Natural. Spiritual. You already know what that is, that no one can correct the Pope. The Pope has the, the power to change scripture, according to them. OK. So this little, little just a little more information here to invade, search out, capture, vanquish and subdue all Saracens and pagans who's on uh, whatsoever and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, not indentured servitude. No, this is what not. This was not indentured servitude. This is perpetual slavery. In other words, not just for the current generations, but what the generations to come. And just because we're not um, on a, a cotton field or a tobacco, you know, uh, any of those things or a sugar uh, plantation doesn't mean that we're not enslaved. 
this system like the Willie Lynch um, system to enslave our people. That was a system to put in place to keep us enslaved even once the chains are off of us. Kind of like when you understand horses or, uh, you know, or dogs. I remember it, actually it's a, a people around, um, a, you know, uh, not too far from where we live at. They have a horse. They have a horse. Literally, they just have a little a string going around their property. And guess what? That horse can easily go past that string, jump over the string. That horse will rush up to the edge of that property and will not go past that string. That's what's happening with many of us. Many of us out, they got a string around us, right? To change what the definition of what hope is. And now guess what? We're afraid to go beyond that string. There's nothing holding you. You did run well, but what hindered you? Or should I say who hindered you? Anyway, to reduce their personal, their persons to perpetual slavery and to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors, the kingdoms, dukedoms, countries, right? Oh, excuse me, counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and to convert them to his and their use of profit. So is it a coincidence? Is it simply a coincidence that Saint Santa Claus, in other words, Saint Nicholas, has the same name as Pope Nicholas? Is it a coincidence that Santa Claus, St. Nicholas have the same name as Pope, Lit Pope Nicholas? Absolutely not. So when I hear our own brothers and sisters, oh, I'm going to still, I'm just going to still celebrate Christmas and laughing it off. You have no clue about history. None of you guys do. If you're going to still laugh that off and think that it's okay, you want to put up a Christmas tree and all these different things. You are part of the problem. Not the solution. Anyway, wrapping this up. So why would anyone would ever want to marry the seeds of the nation who entered into an agreement to destroy you? Why? Why would you want to do that? That's why it's imperative for us to know our history. Why? Because, again, the Moors, they assisted every nation that enslaved our ancestors. That is a fact. That is a fact. And so we can stop right here. We can stop right here. We can stop right here. That's why I wanted to walk you through. I didn't want to just do a typical lesson, which I could have done. So let me let me, let me just share something with you. This is the overall narrative of those that call themselves teaching our people. Let me show you this 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 deceptive teacher. Right. His name is uh, Ralph Messer. Let me let you hear him. Let, I want you to hear what he says about our people, about not knowing our history. So they have to tell us our history. That's why you have um, the vocab Malones trying to tell us what our history is. They're mad because we're not allowing them to tell us who we are. Why? Because we're taking the, the bull by the horns, per se, and we're addressing the issue ourselves. We, we're making it clear we don't need you to validate us. So, again, when we understand the term mixed marriage, guess what? Why would you want to knowingly marry the seeds of the very people that have declared to be at war with your people? That's the question. That's what we need to address. But let's hear, let's hear what this guy says. If you cannot speak um, and have talk about the history of who they are, um, then they will not really carry your story. They will not understand their story. So today, the first thing I, I, I was the greatest revelation I was telling you a while back um, is that most people trying to reach, and I'm going to specifically talk today, and next week will be Spanish, the following week the Asian, etc. But I'm going to talk to specifically today about the black culture. And I wanted to right now, I know, and how many would agree, that I am not black. Can I get a witness everybody? Amen. Hey, praise you. <laughs> Praise God. Pretty, pretty white to me. Can I get an amen up in here? Yeah. Mm, praise God. Amen. So here's the deal. But what I want to share with you is I want to talk to you about is that, you know, we went across the country. If you cannot speak um, and have talk about the history of who they are, um, then they will not really carry your story. They will not understand their story. So today, the first thing I, I, I was the greatest revelation I was telling you a while back um, is that most people trying to reach, and I'm going to specifically talk today, and next week will be Spanish, the following week the Asian, etc. But I'm going to talk to specifically today about the black culture. And I wanted to right now, 
I know, and how many would agree, that I am not black? Can I get a witness, everybody? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Pretty, pretty white to me. Can I get a amen up in here? Yeah. Mm, praise God. Amen. So here's the deal. But what I want to share with you is I want to talk to you about is that, you know, we went across the country and we found out there's certain things that help reach that culture and reach it effectively, and there's certain things that don't make it happen, okay? And today, I would like to talk about those things that do reach the culture, specifically in the men of the culture. And the first thing I found out is this. I found out that they do not know their history. That's one of the things that I know. And so you have to tell them their history. So today, I'm going to attempt to do that. I hope you guys caught that. Excuse me for fumbling over the record on um, the videos, but I hope you caught that. Let me play it one more time. And this should, this should irk you. This should provoke you to what? Going deeper in your studies and not just going deeper just to have something to prove, to help you rightly divide the word. Let me hear it one more time. And the first thing I found out is this. I found out that they do not know their history. That's one of the things that I know. And so you have to tell them their history. So today I'm going to attempt to do that. Right? Because see, many people have used his videos, right? To say, hey, he's saying that we are the people of the book. Now, if you listen to him, he said that the Southern Kingdom refers to the Ashkenazis as being the Southern Kingdom. The Southern King Kingdom consisted of Judah the Benjamites, and then later the Levites, right? The Northern Kingdom consisted of nine uh, tribes. So why is that important? Why the priests and the royalty, right? Because Benjamin, the first king of Israel, came out of the Benjamites. So that's where many want to be. They want to be the royalty. Why? Because in that royalty, especially when we understand Judah, that's where the Hebrew Israelite Messiah came through. So that's why you see everyone doing all kinds of images of him according to their culture, but not the reflection of the true culture of uh, the Hebrew Israelites. All right. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. And again, let's give this guy a three piece and anyone that's teaching this craziness. Let's toss it out the window. And let's do better at how we articulate and explain the text, because it is a sensitive subject when you're dealing with those that are descendants uh, through mixed marriage, you know, someone that may um, a father or mother may have uh, married or had a relationship with the very people that have oppressed and came and created a constitution, a covenant to destroy us. So let's let's use more compassion when we're dealing with that, because it is a sensitive subject. All right. It is a sensitive subject. So, again, uh, let's you know, let's you know, really use wisdom in how we approach it. All right. So let's see here. Let's see some of the comments as we get ready to wrap up here tonight. Let's see if there's any comments or questions anyone would like to make. Let's see here. Tia Thompson. Let's see here. Uh, I've been very slowly making gains. They know, but don't have any passion. Understand, understand, understand. Let's see here. Uh, up next. I'm having the same issues. You're not alone. This is why we have to be we, we have to pe um, be patient. We have to do what Jeremiah did, because remember, the king of Judah at that time burnt up the original original writings after just reading like uh, eight leaves. Or I think it was three or three or eight leaves and burnt it up, destroyed it. So the most high had to tell him to write it again. So, guys, don't give up on our people. Don't give up on your brothers and sisters. Only thing you can do is just what? Plant that seed of what? Reading this, the seed of what you know. And then somebody else could come and what? Do the same thing. And guess what? Little by little, the most high get the increase. But the key is we need someone that's willing to break up the ground. Matter of fact, we have so many people that want to sow seeds. Right. But we don't have a lot of people that want to till the ground. OK, that's what the work is, is loosening up the soil. But thank you again. Let's see here. Who is that? Who is that photo of, Pastor? This is Noble Drew Ali that you see here. This is the you might as well say the founder 
of the uh the 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 moors right the more science right this is what you see here okay great question all right let's see what other comments that we have here uh gino filippi uh well i'm half negro and half mexican my father hebrew my children are with my wife who is who is also expand uh hispanic i appreciate you for sharing that with us and thank you for taking the time out to watch uh this presentation appreciate appreciate it who else do we have here um uh, up next okay let's see here uh uh sister shawnee i want to say peace and blessings to you sis uh sharice brandon one plant one war on one plant one water and yah gives the increase absolutely let's see who else do we have here uh miss um elaine awesome teaching thank you sis for for your support really appreciate uh, you taking the time out to uh, to watch the presentation. Uh, let's see here. Who else do we have here? Confirmation confirmed. Excellent presentation. Thank you again for taking the time out, guys, to watch this presentation. Let's see. Um, who else do we have? We have um, Sister Yvette um, Powell. Appreciate you. Uh, Miss Elaine again. Uh, let's see here. Yuta. Uh, who else do we have? So I'm just going through here, guys, but I, I hope and pray that this helps you. So, again, we have to, as um, Prisoner of Hope posted here, study the show that self approved. And the key is approved to the most high. OK, approved to the most high. OK, so that's the key. So we have to be what approved to the most high. All right. Um, and so that way we can rightly divide the word of truth. OK, uh, let's see here. Who else do we have here? All right. Sister Shalon, Stockholm syndrome of Christianity got a lot of Israel bound. Absolutely. All right. Let's see here. Chris Curry. Let's see what he says here. I'm going to tell you your history. Wow. Absolutely. That and very arrogant with that. Very arrogant with that. Um, that approach. All right. The playbook of our enemies. Absolutely. Uh, Sister Carol. So, again, guys, I appreciate you guys for taking the time out to watch the presentation, go back over it. Um, it's a lot of information that I shared, um, you know, that have notes within it, uh, write down the notes and, and study for yourself, validate, confirm what I just taught you. All right. Don't just take my word for it. Go back and validate what I just pointed out. All right. So with that being said, family, I really appreciate you guys for tuning in tonight. And um, as we get ready to wrap up, just as um, Moses uh, under the instructions of the Most High in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. He said, as he encouraged the children of Israel, he said, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. Let me say that again. Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. Three things. Fear ye not, stand still. Don't, you know, stop being, you know, don't be all over the place. You know, don't get antsy. Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of who? Yahweh. See the salvation of Yahweh. These Egyptians that you see today, these strongholds that you see today, these uh, tactics, these agendas, all of these different uh, weapons of destruction that they've used to try to suppress our people these strongholds these stumbling blocks we will never have to deal with it again it will not have power over us again why because the most high will fight for us but the key is that we have to what hold our peace can't go back can't stay here keep moving forward can't go back we cannot stay here and we definitely have to move forward for the last time. Can't go back. Can't stay here. Keep moving forward. Shalom.